All right, so yeah, for the people who just came in, this is the beginner testing session, which is basically how you can get started with writing test benches. It'll cover the current peak poke testers we have, um, and it'll also cover some of the testers 2 stuff that I talked about yesterday. Um, testers 2 is experimental, peak poke testers is basically in production. Um, their feature set, uh, testers 2's feature set is mostly a superset of peak poke testers, and otherwise it's mostly a syntactic change. Um, so let's get started. Um, yeah, first thing I know about chisel testing is that our recommended way of testing uses Scala test. Um, Scala test is a unit testing framework for Scala that provides test discovery, execution, and reporting. So what it means is that uh, you just dump a bunch of tests in your test folder as part of your sources, um, and then you run Scala tests, which you can do from within SVT. You just type in test, um, and it'll find all your tests, it'll run them, and it'll tell you if everything failed or not. Um, it's basically just a really convenient and lightweight way to write unit tests. You don't have to do like ridiculous amounts of setup. Um, it's magic. It's great. Um, so chisel testing, again, what I'm going to talk about here is just test stimulus generation. We're not going to talk about formal methods. We're not going to talk about constrained random, except a little bit. But it's basically just you write a test vector and you do something. Um, so how this works is, uh, oh, my mouse is here. Um, there is, you can think of those two paths, right? The RTL design, you start with your uh, module in Scala. Um, on the chisel compile path, elaboration of fertile, fertile compilation to Verilog, um, or low fertile, and then that gets passed into a simulator of your design under test, um, which you then run on your computer. Um, the parallel path for the testers is um, from your module, um, the tester takes your, the IOs of the device under test and combines it with a test bench that you write. Um, and the interface is with the simulators through a driver interface. So you can think of this as kind of co-simulation. Your test bench is uh, running in lockstep with the simulator. Does that make sense? <laughs> because if it, this doesn't make sense, you're going to be very confused. Could you elaborate a little bit? <laughs> what would you want? Me, what do you want me to elaborate I'm on? I'm from a software background, so uh, I'm, I'm a little disadvantaged compared to everyone else. Cool. Um, um, I'm also from a software background. Um, so the idea is basically, um, this makes sense, right? So from your Scala, you have, from your uh, module description, you basically have two things coming out of it. One is the uh, simulator. So you compile everything down to like Verilog or Low Fertile, and then you start up a simulator of that. And from your test bench, you take the IOs from your module, and you compile that down into a something that runs in lockstep with the simulator. Right, so think of your simulator as uh, running like one step per clock cycle. Your test bench runs in lockstep with that. So it'll do like your peaks and pokes. It'll write into the simulator. It'll wait for a clock, and it'll do the next cycle of peaks and pokes. Does that make sense? OK, I also realize that I simulator is the built-in uh, simulator. Ah, we're going to talk about that right now. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, so there are a bunch of choices between the simulators. Um, the two that we mostly support right now are Treadle and Verilator. Um, Verilator compiles Verilog down to C++ and machine code. So it's, I don't want to say it's industry standard because it, it kind of is and it kind of isn't. It's like a bit flaky, but it works if you need to simulate arbitrary Verilog. Um, overall, it has a pretty high startup time because you're compiling your Verilog to C++ and you're compiling your C++. If you try to do this with rocket ship, you'll be like sitting there for five minutes while it compiles. Um, but on the bright side, because it's compiling down to machine code, it has very good cycle performance. So once you get past the startup time, it should run reasonably fast. And it's roughly the same thing VCS does, right? Basically. Um, I hear VCS is a bit less flaky. Um, huh? Yeah, I don't doubt it. I haven't used it yet, but I don't doubt it. I assume there's some reason people are paying the big bucks for VCS licenses. Um, yeah, so I think VCS is also one of the simulator backends we support. At least we used to. I don't know. Um, OK, corner check we do. Cool. Um, it basically does the same thing. It's just proprietary. You need a license, which you need to pay for. Um, and it's apparently pretty good. Um, so on the Berkeley side, we've also built our own simulators. Um, the most common one is the one we're pushing right now is Treadle, which is a Scala-based fertile simulator. Um, basically, the advantage is that it's all from the same process. It just takes in fertile directly, so there's virtually no startup time. 
This is great if you have a bunch of small tests, which you should. If you unit test, please unit test. Um, and it has reasonably decent cycle performance. Uh, main limitation, it can't simulate Verilog black boxes, so you can mainly test only pure chill designs right now, though I think there's some work on getting it to do more Verilog stuff. Um, and you may or may not have also heard of Fertile Interpreter for its short lifetime, uh, it preceded Treadle. It's basically the same thing, except it's slower. Um, it's superseded. You don't need to worry about that. Everyone have a decent <laughs> idea of between simulators? So basically, Treadle is the default because it's on Scala and it has a really fast startup time. Um, and then you can use Verilator or VCS based on like whatever you have. And I'll show you I'll show you uh, live demos of how these work. Um, yes, test bench code is imperative software. Um, you are not writing Chisel. You are writing Chisel test benches. You are not writing hardware. You are writing software. Um, if you get that confused, you're also going to have a very bad day. Um, but yeah, it's sequential code. So one line of code executes after the other. It doesn't generate hardware. This is software running on your computer. Um, Chisel con circuit construction functionality is also unavailable inside the test bench. So you can't do like addition on wires. Um, but you can use Scala libraries. So for example, if you had some DSP code you want to test, you could import whatever Scala DSP functionality is out there, have a like compute your inputs and then give you an output test vector. Um, and the test benches are co-simulation, which I talked about earlier. Uh, there is a whole bunch of testers right now. Um, the only two that are basically in use are the peak poke testers and testers too. Peak poke testers provides basic circuit access through peak, poke, check, and set, which I'll get into more on the next slide. This is probably the most common test driver in use, and if you want a production grade or some definition of production grade test driver, this is the one you should use. Testers 2 is a presentation I gave yesterday. It's a variant on peak poke tester with some nicer syntax and fork joint concurrency. It's experimental. Um, obviously, I'm going to encourage you to try it, but I'm obviously biased too. So if you have a reasonable tolerance for things that are a bit rough around the edges, uh, please try it. And of course, I'll show <laughs> examples of both. Um, in the live demos. Um, there's a few other testers. Basic tester is mostly used in Chisel 3 internals. Um, and the philosophy there is hardware testing hardware. So you specify your DUT driver uh, in Chisel as a circuit. Um, I don't particularly like it, but it's there. And it's very lightweight, if nothing else, but not the easiest to use. Um, there's also advanced tester, which don't think about it. Um, we, no one uses it anymore. Um, the application was you could have post and pre cycle actions, which was great for uh, stateful actions like decouple drivers. No one uses it, don't use it. Question. Yeah. Is Testers 2 available out of the box in uh, the default chisel version? Or do we have to clone this separately? Uh, yes and no. Um, so all uh, both Peak Poke Tester and Testers 2, they are not part of the Chisel package. Um, they are part of their own package, but you can pull in both of them through SBT, Maven. So you just register dependency, and I'll pull it in automatically. Um, Peak Poke Tester, we have production versions. Testers 2, um, we publish a snapshot once in a while that somewhat works because it's so experimental. Um, and essentially, the end goal for us is that Testers 2 should be integrated into the base Chisel package because, like, you don't build chips without testing your chips, and it doesn't make sense not to have a default tester. Um, but for development purposes, while we're building it, we're keeping a separate repo so that people don't have to juggle branches, which is kind of a mess. Cool. Um, so these are your basic test abstractions. Um, poke is basically write or assign the value of a wire. The Verilog test bench equivalent is wire assign. Hooray. <laughs> Um, expect is an assert, so check that the value on a wire is equal to something. Um, Verilog apparently does not have a built-in assert function, so what people apparently do is display and finish. Uh, that's apparently a common uh, macro. Um, step uh, advances time by a clock cycle. Um, Verilog equivalent is you step by one cycle. Um, you all, In Verilog, you step by some amount of wall time, which we don't have. Testers, to, testers doesn't really expose that abstraction. Testers is purely clock-based. Um, and then peak has returned a value on a wire as a Scala numeric type. So it's basically query the simulator for the value on the wire, give it back to Scala, and do something with it. 
Um, there, the closest Verilog equivalent is a wire read, but since Verilog isn't co-simulation, um, there kind of isn't an equivalent. Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah, so on, is there like a primitive for weight for rising edge of some signal? Ah, so this is where we get into uh, composition. There is not a primitive yet, but um, there are merits to having that primitive, which we can talk about more if you'd like. Um, but the solution to that is you should compose using Scala constructs. So you could put a while uh, wire.peak does not equal whatever value you need to clock that step. Um, but if you do have that as a fundamental abstraction, you can do some things like, oh, now it's synthesizable because you don't return control back to Scala. Okay, so that's basically it for the introduction. Um, and hopefully you have at least somewhat of a mental model of how testing works, right? It might be a fuzzy mental model because I haven't gotten into examples yet, but everyone feeling comfortable? Cool. Uh, so learn by example, uh, GCD. This is now online on GitHub. Uh, this TV has cut off part of my screen. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so the examples are online. Chisel, uh, CCC18 testing intensive. You can't see the E there because the TV ate the E. Um, so if you want to look at these examples later, they are online. Um, and basically, what I'm going to go over is project configuration setup, uh, walkthrough of the GCD module, test invocation syntax. Um, I'll show you GCD with the peak hook tester. I'll show you a little bit about test automation and a little bit about property verification with Scala check. Um, and then I'll sh also show you the testers to syntax and uh, proposing test abstractions. Um, and finally, I just threw in a shift register for kicks and giggles. Uh, no, that actually shows you a good application of fork join testing. All right, so let's get started. Um, so if you look over here, I have this uh, console up. Um, I am, note that I am in Windows. Um, you can basically run all this stuff in either Windows or Linux. You can't run Vera later in Windows, um, but I'll get around that in a moment. Um, all right. The official Git page doesn't find the Windows support. Does the Linux and Mac? Uh, For what? On the official Git site. For which? Windows support. For Vera later or Chisel? Chisel. Uh, Chisel should run on Windows out of the box. Um, you cannot run a default test because they depend on Verilator, but as you will see here, Chisel runs on Windows. Um, if it doesn't, that's a bug. Um, and I'm surprised I haven't run into it yet. All right, so let's talk about GCD. Um, so over here is a GCD code, and I'm really not going to go into how it works, but I have a with parameterized GCD input bundle, which takes in two numbers. Um, you can ignore all this stuff for now. This is uh, bundle literal constructors code that I hackly wrote. Um, it'll be used in the testers to example in a moment, but uh, treat all this as if it didn't exist. So the GCD module basically is, uh, I have an IO, I have a decoupled input, that is the uh, two integer bundle, and then I have an output that returns a single integer. And what it does is it calculates the GCD of the inputs over several cycles and then it fires uh, valid when it's done. Um, and this is just done using some stock algorithm um, and there is some ready valid interlocking code. Does this mostly make sense about what GCD does? GCD is greatest common denominator, by the way, just in case. All right, so say I wrote a bunch of tests, which they're just magically there. Um, and the easiest way to run a test is, you can see I am in the uh, repository folder right now. I can start up SPT. This will take some amount of time. Just be patient. Maybe. Make sure this is still running. Yep, that's still running. So yeah, you'll see that I'm running SBT in interactive mode where I have a console because the startup time takes like a minute and I don't want to wait a minute every time I run my test. So it's nice to have uh, this console active. And okay, finally loaded. So uh, easiest thing to do to run all the unit tests, I just type in test, enter. Um, it's gonna incrementally compile things and 
going to run my test, hopefully. So you can see that it's uh, compiling the chisel designs. It's doing stuff to test vectors. It ran and it ran all the tests and it passes. This is how easy running tests is. You start up SVT and you type in test and it runs your test. It's great. We're making unit testing easy. Um, but yeah, does this mostly make sense? Cool. Um, so there's a bit of a setup to getting all these test things up and working. Um, Almost all of it is just in your uh, SVT file, which uh, you set your project dependencies. So over here, I've created this uh, SVT project definition, with name, version, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the main important things here are you obviously need to depend on Chisel, because that's what you're generating hardware in. Um, if you're using the uh, peak poke tester, you import this line of code, which is uh, you add Chisel IO testers as a dependency. This package contains the peak poke testers and a bunch of other testers. The peak poke testers is basically what you actually want. Um, if you want to use testers 2 as a dependency, while well, it's still in a pre release, um, you would have that line of code which pulls in the latest snapshot version, which could be anything, and you just hope that we don't break your APIs. Um, does this mostly make sense? This is basically all there is to the project setup. You choose the tester you want to use, and you import it. Yeah. So you only need to import one of the two, right? Yep. If you want to mix and match, you can use both, but I don't think there's a great reason for that either. And how frequently are the snapshots published? Um, for testers, too. For testers, too, yeah. Uh, when I feel like it. OK. And it includes all the transitive dependencies of SVT as well, right? Yes. OK. Um, you probably you may or may not still want to import Chisel. I don't know. Um, yeah, you, you you just this works right because we can obviously see the test working. I'm sure you, you might be able to like delete test, uh, delete the chisel de uh, dependency and it might still work because it's probably being pulled in by testers too or maybe not. Um, we're not going to go into that. All right, so let's take a look at a test um, GCD spec. Um, this is probably similar to what I was talking about yesterday. Um, so here is the uh, bulk of the tester under peak poke tester. I create a tester class that takes in the dot as a parameter, and this extends the peak poke tester, which I pass in the dot to its uh, parameter. So this is basically a test bench. Um, I poke some input bits, so A and B is 6. Um, I set valid to high for one cycle. Um, I step to actually enqueue the input, and then I deassert valid. And then while the uh, output valid is not ready yet, so while peak is equal to zero, I just keep stepping. So this is how you do the uh, wait for by composition. And then once it's all done, I check that the output is correct. Um, and one crucial thing is if you want something, if you want any of the print or assert actions to fire on the last cycle, you need to make sure you step it for a cycle after the end. Does this test bench mostly make sense? Yeah. I've got a quick question with uh, poking. The yeah. second parameter there is the number of cycles you said that you keep it at that value. Oh, uh, no. So poking, um, this is the wire I want to poke, yeah, yeah, and this the is the value. I got yeah. you. Okay. So it, um, this is just my ignorance of, of how this mm -hmm. kind of thing would usually go. But once you poke a value, it just remains that way until yeah. another. Okay. Pokes are latching. Um, okay. This is different in testers, too, and you'll see that in a moment. But mm -hmm. this is peak poke testers. Um, so yeah, that's basically the core of the test bench. Um, and in, uh, yes, you have a question. Sure, quick question. If the module I'm passing in as a parameter is actually a top level module and has hierarchy underneath it, mm -hmm. from peak and poke, can I traverse that hierarchy to assert some value at a lower level? Or Should we poke internal wires? Um, no. The API doesn't support it. Not right now, at least. The yeah, there's a couple things on the horizon. One is the boring utils that you heard the other day. I think it has a top, you know, full word of the top, top full, full signals to the top. The underlying tester, like the, the treadle and the fertile interpreter, both can support that. Uh, so it's sort of an API issue for us, but I'm not so sure about Verilator. And so it might be we could add some extension that would just fail when tried to use with a Verilator back end, but would. So, so the, uh, that's the answer at the moment, so basically, no, but there are other ways of doing it. I would say that there are probably cases where you might want to do something like that, um, 
doesn't exist yet. Yeah. If you want to submit a pull request, <laughs> you can submit a pull request. I think that would be well. <laughs> or an issue. An issue would be yeah. probably more appropriate. I mean, I'll code. take code when I can get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's less yeah, code I have to write. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a All right. So um, this is uh, this is only the test logic. Um, it's not actually the Scala test test. This is actually what Scala test will detect. Um, basically, this is a spec that extends Scala test flat spec um, with matchers. Matchers provides this uh, should be something syntax. Um, flat spec provides the rest of scaffolding. So the way you write a Scala test test is uh, you have like this is a test. This is behavior of GCD. And these are individual test cases that run on it. So GCD should obviously compute GCD. And this is the test body. And you can see here that uh, this uh, the output is kind of out of order in that because all the tests are running in parallel. We can see that it has the, oh, here's the uh, spec being tested. And here's the individual test cases. And they're all green. Um, so inside the test case, I can just do uh, this is the magical test invocation for peak poke tester, driver.execute. You can optionally pass in uh, command line string parameters, um, and then you pass in the uh, dot constructor. So basically, I say I want a 32-bit GCD, um, and then in here is the test body, which is basically I need to uh, give it this peak poke tester object. Uh, this should be true. I think just means make sure the test passes instead of the test fails. Does this syntax make sense? Is your test return true somewhere? Um, I think this driver dot execute thing should return true. Doesn't. Yeah. Like well, it says uh, oh, at the bottom. It says it should be true. Yeah. Um, I can't bring up the API for this. You can see my Eclipse configuration is kind of messed up. It's not detecting the links between projects correctly. Um, but yeah, so I can run tests individually by using tests only. Uh, ah, there is also tab autocomplete and listing. So if I want to run GC spec, I can just GCD spec. And I can run that one test. You can see it's labyrinth design, and it's uh, compiling. Make sense? Cool. Um, so in terms of debugging, you have a few options. Um, one is good old printf. Um, so one thing you can actually do is, uh, because this is the test bench is basically a Scala program, you can just put print lines in there. And you can put uh, poke statements in print lines. So if I was to run that test again, you can see it's printing out the uh, internal state, out.val to zero, and it's printing out the bits as it tries to compute GCD. So that's one thing you can do. Um, people get a lot of mileage out of printf and print line. Um, you can also do print lines in your, uh, in your hardware itself. So for example, if on every cycle I just wanted to print x, y, and alpha valid, I can do that. And if I run the test again, it's going to compile the hardware. And you can see that over here, um, it's dumping the internal state of x and y. Um, and this is approximately how GCD is computed. Um, and on the last one, the uh, output value, or valid is 1 when x is 3. So GCD of uh, 15 and 6 is 3, which is correct. Um, other cool things you can do with printf is you can actually guard printfs on a condition. So for example, if I only wanted the uh, final result, I might say when io.out.valid is true. Um, then do that print. So if I run that again, um, it tells me, oh, hey, it's valid. Um, it only printed it when the valid is true, which is when it finishes the computation. And of course, I can also add a somewhat, uh, I can also add the input transactions too if I want. So if I run that again, it's going to say, oh, so over here is where it enqueued the input a equals 15, and the output result, uh, result of 3 valid is 1. Does printf debugging make sense to everyone? Yeah. So the only thing I was lost on is why it printed uh, x equals 3, y equals 0, valid equals 0. Is uh, that true where for is the that? entire clock cycle? When you print it, you did print up here. everything in the module, every step. Here? Yeah. Um, Good question. Um, I think this probably has to do with how the uh, thing works. I'm not actually sure. I don't actually. I haven't. I mean, okay. To be fair, it's like a three. It's like a what, five line module. I should understand this more, but I don't really. Um, but um, printouts fire at the end of each clock cycle. 
So right before the registers propagate. So there was one cycle where x was 3, y is 0, and valid was 0. Okay. Um, which and then it got registered and valid with high. And there was no change in x and y. Is what I'm understanding. Uh, yes. I'm not sure why it does that. Um, but apparently it does. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. The printf occurs on the rising edge. Huh? I think the printf occurs on the rising edge of the clock. Before the rising edge or after rising edge? Well, at that instance. I mean, you can't do it on the rising edge. It's either right before or right after, right? Because otherwise your registers are in, like, state of superposition, and that's not great. Um, Uh, yeah, so that's printf. Um, that's a good question. I don't know why it's doing that, and I'm not sure if we want to look too much into GCDRTL right now. Okay. In terms of sampling, like when you were doing on the test bench side here, um, you only see updates to outputs after a step, or like if GCD it contains some combo logic, could you fork it and then read it in the next step? Combinational logic happens instantaneously. So the moment you poke something, a uh, follow-up peek will have propagate all the combinational logic. So, um, cool. Everyone happy with, yeah? Sorry to keep asking That's fine. Questions, questions are good. Double equals zero for that while condition, uh -huh. um, as opposed to like a chisel when we have to do the triple equals for right. qualities. So peek returns something as a, uh, Scala, as a Scala numeric type. Okay. Um, so, you are doing a Scala comparison, not a, uh, you're not, triple equals generates a uh, comparator hardware, whereas this is, you're asking Scala to compare some values like in a program. Okay, thanks. Cool. Um, so over here, you know, there's this array thing, right? You can pass in command line arguments. So for example, if you want to run Verilator, you can actually do that. And I'm pretty sure this is not gonna work. Yeah. So obviously you can't do this on Windows because I don't have Verilator. But if you have Ubuntu inside Windows, um, okay, I don't want to test everything. Okay, this is gonna be fun. Okay, meantime we're gonna get set up for the next part of it. Um, so while that tries to spin and do something and run all the tests I really don't care about because I should have done a test only. Um, Inside your uh, directory, um, the repository, you'll see this thing called test run dir, which contains all the test files, which I'm just nuked. Um, and I'm just going to run gcd. So you can see that I created this folder, which contains all the test artifacts, compiled Verilog, uh, Verilator files. Uh, and when you're using Verilator, it also dumps out a vcd for you. So if you're the kind of person who likes waveform viewers, um, we can open up PTK Wave and uh, browse that. So yeah, um, this basically gives you your uh, device center tests. I want clock. I want reset. Give me input. Be ready. Out ready. I don't know, give me x and y, and then we can have uh, x, y, uh, out valid, and out this. So if you like waveform viewers, you'll probably like this. Um, and as you can see, what the peak poke testers does by default is it holds reset high for some amount of cycles, um, and then your test starts. So over here uh, on the first cycle, this is where the test driver sets a and b to uh, uh, 15 and 6, um, and it asserts valid for uh, one clock cycle. Um, you can see that that latches that into uh, X and Y internal registers. Then they uh, compute the GCD, and when this thing is a zero, it asserts the output is valid. Um, does that make sense? So yeah, uh, TLDR, you can view results using waveform viewers. Um, there's probably a way to enable this waveform dump and treadle, but like, it does this default button in there later. Um, but you have to run Vera later under Linux. This is, uh, what is it, Ubuntu under Windows subsystem for Linux. So I guess technically you're running Vera later under Windows, but not really. Um, 
yeah, that was a sideshow. Um, so another cool thing you can do, because this is all just Scala, is you can uh, write loops. Right, so over here, the test setup is exactly the same as before, except I'm calling this new tester. So if you wanted to like test your GCDs with like inputs from i and j from 1 to 10, you can do that too. GCD loop tester? Yeah, so this will just work. Um, and I'm pretty sure this isn't very interesting. Um, but what it's basically doing is it's looping for i and j 1 to 10. It's poking a and b with i and j. And then over here, I'm calculating this GCD function in software, which is the expected result. And I expect that it gets the uh, expected test vector. That must make sense. This is how you can do like semi-exhaustive testing. And you can obviously, it took a lot more time here because it ran close to 100 tests. So it took 562 cycles instead of the few cycles it was running before. Any questions? OK, I guess this mostly makes sense. Cool. Um, if we want to move on, um, there's also this thing called Scala check. Um, Scala check is something like property verification, which um, the features that I care about from using Scala check in uh, to little testers is uh, you can have uh, generators. So what this is doing is it's saying uh, choose an integer from 1 to 256. Um, and then for all A and B uh, choices of those integers, um, run this test. Um, this for all construct actually samples the input space, so it's not like doing you know, 256 times 256 tests. I think it's just picking like 10 random ones and hoping it doesn't fail. So this is kind of a bit of constrained random testing. Um, and the main thing over here is um, you'll see that I moved the for all into the uh, spec instead of inside the uh, tester itself. So the one difference here is that this actually does multiple invocations of the uh, test execution. So uh, so you will see that it elaborates the design multiple times, one for each input. Um, it's mostly a style thing. Like It obviously takes time to rerun the Fertile compiler to spin up the tester and whatnot. So if you can like do more with a single test, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Uh, if you're creating a longer test is uh, in the collateral that's created, is there like a set of dump files created for each test? Or uh, for example, if you're doing printf statements inside, instead of just printing out the console, is there any sort of dump? I don't know. Do we have, oh, sorry. Do we have dump files for each? Do we generate dump files at all? In, uh, directing printouts not to console yeah, but to so file. I mean, do any of the tests redirect uh, printouts or no. results to well, an output dump file? They don't, but you can do it. You can do it yourself. Um, I mean, you want to catch all the printouts and put them somewhere? Yeah. So instead of having it pollute the console window. Um, yes. Um, you, if you. Console. Like, you have a good use case, open an issue. No, it would be a good thing. <laughs> there's a naive way of doing it, which is just there's a Scala uh, construct called with console. And then okay. you just say with console and give it a, like a string buffer, I think. Okay. And then everything that's written to the console or the standard out essentially will be collected in that string buffer. And in the end, you can say, you can write that out with a print writer. That's going to have all the stuff that happens within that scope. Yeah. But that you can capture with file. Yeah. You can, of course, run this thing with, uh, if you're running SBT specific commands, you can run them and redirect the output to anywhere you want. Yeah. So that works well, too. I was just wondering if there's some, some sort of automated way to do it. Can Scala output to different pipes when you do print or something? Well, the, the printf is happening down inside the tester. and. That's a, there's no specification, right? Yeah. Inside the simulator. So the, the Scala stuff, I mean, you could redirect standard I.O., but the printf itself doesn't have a, a, a file handle. So uh, of course, that could be done. But um, well, actually, you know, Verilator, as far as I know, doesn't do that. Maybe it has some option. But um, the, 
the, the Scala simulators we have, it wouldn't be hard to add that capability if that was important. Yeah, if you have an idea of have an idea of how this could be implemented elegantly, open an issue. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that a lot. Um, so yeah, this is an example of a more parameterized tester because instead of just giving it a device center test, I'm also giving it like the test vector, so A, B, and expected output, and the test logic is still the same. Um, I'm just passing A, B, and expected output through to here. So that's basically all I have for peak poke tester. Does this mostly make sense as to how you can do unit testing in Chisel? Yeah? I'm going to miss this, but how do you tell if it passes or fails? Ah. Uh, or how, like, how do you change that? So let's say that, you know, I mess up my GCD okay, so and I can't map. Um, and if I run the thing here, um, it's going to hopefully, t yeah, it's going to be false was not true, which I guess isn't too helpful of an error message. I'll, sh I'll show you the better message in testers too. But can, you, can you add a, uh, a message to the expect line? I know that you can in, in uh, uh, Python. I'm not sure, but we can try. Lol. <laughs> I guess, uh, it didn't. It didn't give me a syntax <laughs> error, but it also didn't lol at me. What, so, what at? Um, so I added this thing. I assume that this is supposed to tell me something failed, and uh, it doesn't tell me it failed like that. Well, you went over the mess thing. Yeah. I mean, it might mean something else. But is that is that expect? That is expect. I think it is a message for. Is there a way to tell which expect failed if you had multiple expects in your test? Wait, the line number rewarder? Uh, no. Yeah, it's pointing to a different line. Yeah, it's telling me it's telling me that this thing failed because driver execute was not true. So this is one of the weaknesses of the peak poke tester. It doesn't have good diagnostic. Um, and you know, when I was playing with this, what I would just do is, oh, doesn't work. Let me see if it works now. This is obviously a debugging anti-pattern, and I highly don't recommend this. But like. If you just need some way to tell if your test worked or not, or if one expect was causing it, you can comment out lines until it passes. Once again, I'm not saying this is good programming practice or that you should do this, but you can do this. All right. Uh, any other questions about peak book testers before we move on to testers too? Yeah. You're mentioning something about the for all and mm -hmm. this, um, you put it, you put it in um, the testing for the for as opposed to the for yeah. tester. Because Oh, for all is a uh, Scala check construct, or actually it's a Scala test, Scala check construct. There's a bit of blending between the two. So I actually can't put it in here unless this extends the uh, Scala test stuff. So it has to be in here. It's a bit of a structural limitation. Okay. Yes. One last question. Yeah. Um, is there any example about how to read in, say, uh, file test vectors? And then yeah. how do I cast that to the correct? Type in poke. Um, so poke just takes a Scala int. So like over here, you could like have it read in a CSV or something. Um, that's a Scala programming question. Um, if this was a live demo, I'd probably like look up the APIs sure. for CSV reading. But that's basically how you would do it. And if it was say more than 32 bits or whatever, whatever the int limitation would mm -hmm. be. Um, I think it should take in the big int too. And if it was 256 bits? Biggin is arbitrary precision, okay. I think. Okay. Or arbitrary with. Yes. Yeah. Um, you might not get great performance, simulation performance, but uh, everything it's is. Surprisingly good. OK. Thanks. Let's move on to testers, too, because now I can show you uh, what's wrong with all the testers. Um, so testers, too, is basically um, test plus abstractions. So um, over here, um, this is the uh, testers2 provides a in queue and dequeued abstraction on a decouple. So I have the ready valid source and the ready valid sync. Um, so I can create an input driver um, of c.io.in, and I can create an output driver of c.io.out, um, and then I can just call in queue and dequeue operations on it. So this basically condense all the lines of code here um, into this. Does this mostly make sense? So basically, I'm saying in queue, a, uh, in queue the bundle of 15 and 6. And then DQ expect is basically wait for valid uh, DQ the uh, value and expect. 
So if I uh, think this is T2 PCB spec, it will, I mean, I'm pretty sure this isn't really exciting because all you see is green, right? Uh, one cool thing about testers too is that it actually provides a decent, decent fault localization. Um, so over here, and this probably isn't going to be too helpful um, because it will fail inside this function, but it'll tell me that a test failed um, and package up. Okay, I think. Uh, wait, what? Uh, okay. should work um, because this is a uh, test helper function so if it fails inside there it doesn't give me great diagnostics information um, okay and I guess I probably messed with the call chain a bit but this will when this work properly it'll actually tell you um, the expect call that failed so it should say something like t2gc spec dot scala 21 um, but I guess that doesn't work right now because I probably changed the uh, call depth um, yeah, okay. Well, that was a broken demo. That's fine, too. Um, but yeah, but does this uh, test abstraction mostly make sense? So you're writing tests at a more transactional level. So is there any similar syntax niceties for things that are not decoupled either? Uh, ah, so you can implement them yourself. Um, good question, by the way. Um, so if I was to look in the uh, testers too, where these test helpers are implemented, I have this thing called test adapters, and you can see the implementation of a ready valid source. It basically takes in the I/O and the clock, and I can just have the uh, enqueue functions, which I've defined here. And you can write your own function in the style, right? It's basically expect ready to be true, poke the bits, uh, poke valid, and then step, um, and then when everything, when this scope closes, which is after this step, uh, both these pokes become invalid. It's a lot of Scala code that I don't understand. Really? What doesn't make sense here? So what is time scope? Oh, um, this is the uh, tester suit stuff I talked about yesterday. The idea is basically um, to do some of the thread checking stuff, which I haven't talked about yet, um, you need to associate a duration with a poke. Um, you can like put a duration right after the poke, um, but that's just kind of like annoying because you have to think about it. So the idea is that um, the time scope owns a poke, and when it when you uh, end the scope, all the pokes become invalid. So this is how you get implicit durations associated with pokes, and also provides a uh, cleaner syntax to do the typical strategy of oh you have a default value, so valid is default uh, false. And then at some point, when you call in queue, you temporarily override it. If I wanted to make that time scope five cycles, I'd use step five. Of the yeah. Time. Now, of course, this is probably going to break the test if I try to run it, but you know. Let's see some more red. It might not break anything. Oh, I guess it was fine. Yeah, because the uh, GCD keeps the output. So uh, how do I find this code? So, so this would be in the testers2 repository, which is in, you know, if I just used the SPP file mm -hmm. to pull it in, I wouldn't have this code directly, but I'd have to go clone it from somewhere. This code is also on an open repo online. Okay. Is it, it's in Maven, though, right? It's both in Maven and open source. Right. So essentially, you just add a dependency line to your SPT file, your build.spt. But if you want to look at the source. Right. right. No, but your IDE should be able to do that. Oh, okay. I don't know how to do that. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So you, yeah, you, you could just go to that repo and look at okay. the source and load it. Or publish it local. Is there, yeah, I, 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 I use IntelliJ and I can just, okay. I can just say, take me to the source of that statement and, and go and look at it. Because I mean, a lot of this is on the scholar. We publish the source with the jars, so when they get downloaded, it's, it's available. Feel free to, like, open issues or email us if you have any questions on all this stuff. It's a lot to take in. Um, so you have an explicit clock here, whereas previously you didn't? Yes. What's um, the reason for that? Peak poke testers, um, you step by the master clock. Um, in testers too, when you step, you have to give it a clock to be associated with. 
So on a tester two, it has better multi-plot support in that sense. Yeah. Um, so I can see that like an asynchronous clock crossing or something, yeah. and I could have to test you, the master clock, whatever the heck. Yeah, so if you have multiple clock domains, it's a lot better here, because you can be clear about which clock you're advancing. And for the time scope thing, is the main reason to do that the like avoiding having to manually reset valid to false, or is there kind of a broader use case? Um, there's two reasons for it. That is one reason. You're being very explicit with how long signals last in a way where you don't have the huge cognitive overhead of reasoning through cycles and just like duplicating ones everywhere. Um, the second one is it allows a uh, good method for ownership. So when you have threading and you can have multiple threads try to poke a wire, you need to know which one owns a wire. Um, so that the compiler or the test infrastructure can catch if you did something wrong. Like if you have two threads simultaneously poking a wire, that's an error. And I would rather the test infrastructure yell at me than just say, oh yeah, this is fine. I just picked a random one. And like your test is probably guaranteed to be non-deterministic. So it doesn't prevent you from doing something non-deterministic when it yells at you when you do this? Yes. Because non-deterministic. Uh, all the testers are Scala programs, so we don't do any syntax analysis on it. Um, it's all runtime, not checks. Can you only poke on uh, interface signals or also internal signals? Uh, currently, you can only poke on interface signals. Um, I don't think there is a fundamental reason why you shouldn't do the latter. Um, it's probably something that just needs to be implemented. Um, like, if you have a good reason for it, uh, open an issue. and. Ideally, you also submit some code, but like um, we may or may not work on that. The, the steps are independent. So like if I have just a fully combinational module, mm -hmm. um, the step will just traverse one time unit, but mm -hmm. there's no requirement that there's a clock fork or anything on that module. There is a requirement there's a clock fork on a top level module, okay. uh, at least in testers too. Um, and that is the... Uh, that is essentially your smallest time unit. You can have other clocks in there and can step on those clocks, um, but you need to have at least uh, a main clock that is your uh, fastest time unit or shortest time unit. Those are so that's an explicit IOC call, it's not the implicit clock. That is the implicit clock. You need to pass a model for an implicit clock and reset for testers too. Cool. Okay. Um, and in testers too, you can also do, uh, you can also use Scala check. I think there's a Scala check, right? Yeah. So over here, I'm basically saying create a new GCD, um, create the implement output drivers, and then for all, uh, using the same uh, generators as before, I'm saying in queue, A, B, and then expect the output. Um, and this will also run, as one might expect. So this is basically how you can build your own test abstractions and uh, compose them and have very short, sweet tests where you just say, oh, create these transaction level drivers and do stuff on them. <coughs> Any questions? How much of this is impossible or is this just difficult to do with the traditional test? Deep poke testers? Yeah. Um, creating test abstractions is pretty difficult, especially when they're reusable. Um, because, um, where is it? With GC spec, you have to do poke something, and this poke is a function that is exposed in peak poke tester. So, like, I can't just say, like, something, something, def, uh, decoupled poke, uh, x, data, um, and then I can't just do, like, poke x1 or something, because the poke is a function that is here only. Um, I mean, like, I guess you could, like, pass in the peak poke tester as maybe a this, um, but it's probably still a lot of boilerplate. Yeah. Uh, testers to address a lot of syntax shortcomings with uh, peak poke tester. But couldn't I define, like, methods in the class? Yeah, you uh, could certainly define... Um, GCD tester. Yeah, so, like, like you do def, um, decouple, and queue, whatever, right? Um, the problem is it's not very reusable because now um, your t all your testers have to extend this. You could you could have it like a decoupled tester library um, instead of whereas over uh, in testers two it's all just imported through this uh, 
test adapters, and that can contain like a bunch of utilities. Got it. Yeah. So, so it's it's a lot of structural. Uh, it's not fundamental. It's mostly just structural and ease of use. Cool. Let's talk about threading quickly. Um, so shift registers. This is basically the example of uh, from the, the time scope and the threading stuff is impossible at all in the peak process. Right? Yeah. So this idea of where you have a default and then you override a wire for some amount of time, you can't do that. I mean, you can emulate that by like do an explicit revert, but all your hooks are still latching. All right. So uh, this is testers two with uh, a shift register. What I'm testing is. Uh, I have this module with an input and output, both 8 bits, and it's basically a uh, four cycle delay shift register. Um, and it's always nice to just to write this, uh, again, this test helper uh, abstraction where shift test. Um, I basically assert the input for once clock, wait three clocks, and then expect something on the output. And because of the shift register, I want to pipeline the input. So I want to have 42 on the first cycle, 43 on the second cycle, 44 on the third cycle, instead of doing like, 42 on the first cycle, wait for it to propagate all the way through, then 43, wait for it to propagate all the way through. Um, so this is the idea of fork, which creates a new thread in parallel. So it's basically, I'm uh, saying in Q42, uh, step one clock without waiting for this to complete. That just runs by itself in another thread. And then one clock later, I'm creating, you could think of as another instance of shift test um, in another thread that's in queuing 43. Um, does this test style make sense? No, that doesn't really make sense. Oh, okay. What well, doesn't make sense? What is each thread responsible for doing? Actually? So the idea of each thread is that it. Um, so you can see this. Uh, does does it make sense what this is doing? The shift test. Yes. Yes. So what it's doing is it's asserting the input for one cycle. It's waiting three cycles for a total of four cycles um, before it checks the output. Um, the idea is that I want to pipeline the uh, shift register, right? I don't want to wait four cycles for this for this value to propagate all the way through, but I still want to have this uh, test helper reusability. I don't want to like manually write this and interleave the uh, values into shift register in my main test function. So this is almost as if you have like a bunch of virtual shift registers, each one of which only has one value, and then you're kind of like uh, poking them at different points. You can think of it that way. Um, it's fundamentally the abstraction software, so you don't have shift registers, yeah, right? right? Don't mix your abstractions. You're going to have a very bad day if you mix your hardware and software abstractions. Um, but the idea is basically this uh, this function uh, runs independently in time from the main test. So I can call this function to in Q42, and that's running independently of this one where on the next clock cycle, I'm having so, in Q43. So I guess that's There's only one C. Huh? There's only one shift register, yeah. C, that you're yeah. using in these multiple threads. Yes. But each okay. instance, you can think of it as an instance of shift test call, um, is essentially offset by one cycle to each other. So that's how the uh, value pipelining works. So if you, at the end of the shift test method, mm -hmm. you added one more clock step, and and then you did out dot expect something. Would anything show up there? That, I think that's what I'm confused about. What do you mean? So okay, so if at the end there you added uh -huh. one more clock step, like that? Yeah. And now could you expect some value? Could you? Could I expect like 43 to show up? Um, as the first value. As as the next. So the first thread puts in 42. Yeah. And so it'll show up three cycles later. You could. Uh, so you'd have to pass in the next value, right? So over here, I could do, and then I can just say, okay, 42, and then I can do like. And then that would work. Yeah. Um, obviously, don't do this because this is a bad abstraction. Um, but I think that should pass. Huh. Because you have to know what the next value is after. Uh, I think this would say 44. I don't know. I'm not sure what it's going to do. Does it not open on set of valid ones? I'd like to. I guess so. Um, 
Well, you don't. You didn't step again, right? So the forty-four just hung around. Uh, it should have joined on it though. Okay. Well, it's zero. Is that going to do something else? So the join is going to keep calling step oh, until that, that, that is all of the. Wait, what did I say? Oh, I'm not running the right test. Uh, to, uh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I think it's actually going to be zero because um, once this time scope goes out of scope, it reverts to a default, and right now it's hard coded as zero. So if I did 44, this should actually fail. Um, eventually, I would like four state simulation where you get a big bright red X, but we don't have that right now. Can you pull up the design for a second? Just show the shift Ah, uh, it's right here. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. That, that, that is actually design. What I'm relying on is uh, one of the Chisel 3 utils libraries. Um, let me bring that up for a moment, uh, if I can find it. Uh, huh, where did it go? Um, Maybe this guy. Uh, ah, just register. Just register. Apply. Uh, it is this one. So it's basically a bunch of reg uh, chain to the next one written in this very functional programming style. So this is the implementation of just register in the Little standard library. Uh, any questions, or is anyone still, everyone still thoroughly confused? So join is gonna just keep calling like that step yeah. until until the target thread is done. So it's waiting for uh, the thread that was just forked to finish. When you said thread, thread, are these actually different software threads? These are different software threads. Um, so implementation though, ideally we'd use something like coroutines because those are more performant. But Scala coroutine support is kind of a total dumpster fire. So we don't do that. Um, threads do have a there is a performance penalty associated with threading, but um, my hope is that you'll be so much more productive with your tests that tests are probably like developer driven instead of execution so limited. How, how bad would it be if you had printouts in your ship register implementation? Uh, let's find out. Uh, what do you want to print? Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so let's print out. Oh, that's a print line in your test, right? Yeah, we can uh, do that. But it's just, you wanted to print out from the circuit, or yeah, I was thinking print out from the circuit. Oh, okay, uh, cool. Let's do that then. Um, but I, I think the result will be the same. Yeah. Uh, I think it's P, right? Um, so we can print uh, in dot bits. Uh, Oh, no, it's not decoupled, it's just in. And, uh, and then just so that we can, uh, uh, P is a uh, print specifier, so, uh, you can use the more conventional C style printf as well, or you just do percent D's and yeah. whatever you need. So in Scala, there's this nice thing called string interpolation, where you have a string and you can put uh, variables in line into it using the dollar sign. Um, you typically, in Scala, you have the prefix as S. Um, in Chisel, we have this P prefix for uh, a hardware print, which means uh, dump the values of that. Um, so yeah, here's the uh, things. So. So here you have the dot and the test bench all in one file? Yes. yes. I'm, 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 a, I'm a little confused. <laughs> yeah. So where's, where's the interface of test? Where, where does it get instantiated? This? Yes. So that's so your dot, right? No. So test, no. Test is the harness. This is a test driver invocation. Test so in a GCD spec, the equivalent would be on this nasty driver dot execute stuff. We just encapsulate all the default values into a single test. So. This is basically uh, becomes that. Um, and it, usually you will not have the case where you have your uh, dot in the same file as 
or even in line with beyond test driver unless your dot is like just a shim over something. Um, so this is not great programming practice either. Um, but it's also such a simple one and it's showing something you can do. Okay, so this might be a great thing if your goal is actually to test shift register, right? I'm just creating a uh, IO shim over um, a helper function. So you can do that and this is how. Ah, you can have asserts in there. So like, um, I don't know, I'll be like assert uh, in 32.u. I can do that, and this is almost certainly going to fail right away. Uh, yeah, but could I say something like four cycles after this input? Um, we do not support linear temporal logic or uh, SVL style assertions yet. Um, people have asked for them. If you would like to implement them, uh, here is an active effort going on. Um, but um, not really. Like you can't create like register arrays or something if you want to try to emulate that given certain assumptions. Um, but there is not like LTL style assertions right now. Um, which will be that assert. You got the wrong assert there. Yeah, definitely have the wrong assert there. Yeah, so sometimes you'll have these weird namespace conflicts. Um, and it's going to tell me that, uh, yeah, this basically, I think this basically means an assertion fired. This does mean assertion fired, right? It's a treadle error. Yeah, it's alighted the, the full stack there, but yes. Yeah, so the assertion fired because obviously it was, the input was not 43 at some point. So this is how you can just do like, always on assertions. Um, you know, being assertive in your uh, programming is obviously a good thing, um, but um, as nice as LTL or SVL style assertions would be, we do not have support for those right now. So I guess kind of a takeaway from that is that there's multiple ways to like achieve your goals. You can put assertions in your uh, uh, test helper function, you can put assertions in your test drivers, you can put assertions in your module, or you can do all of the above. Um, and it's mostly for like reusing those checks and at a higher level. Yeah. Very less familiar way. Yeah. Like if you have like some condition that is always true, uh, it is probably good practice to put it in your hardware. But this is more of like it, this is less of a propping. This is a self-contained test vector of sorts. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of all this stuff. So we have how long do we have left? It's two fifteen now. It seems one hour thirty or one hour fifteen. Yeah, well, we can find out actually, can't we? Because uh, well, it was supposed to end like right now. Does anyone else have any questions? Does the duck have a name? This guy? Yeah. Is there any other duck? Uh. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should have bought more than one plush duck. It does not have a name. I have a lot of these things. <laughs> What's up? So have you tried using this stuff for continuous integration? Um, that is a different thing. Um, continuous integration would be a layer on top of this that just automates your test runs, and you can. So I think the answer is yes. I think. Okay. You can do it. Um, I mean, it does dump out like just the exit code if it fails. One, so there has to be a CI system that integrates with Scala test. This right. just reviews a Scala test. Yeah, I guess we could provide some more tools for it. But internally, we do all these same sorts of tests in our, in our own projects. And then we run those continuous integrations across all PRs and all changes, all, all the changes. In fact, in a lot of times, regressions through the other projects will depend on it. So it's, it's quite a big deal. Can you talk a little bit about your personal experience and the transition of how you guys developed testing over the project? Because it seemed like Chisel 3 came first, mm -hmm. and then you maybe were testing in Model Sim or something else in DCS. Um, so everyone has different experiences with testing, and everyone has their own flow. Uh, my flow has heavily been unit test based because I come mostly from a software background. Um, and it basically uh, came from. Um, JTAG generator, which was, I was playing around with the uh, 
test systems available based on the peak poke tester. And this was just kind of a mess in that, you know, I could write my uh, test abstractions. And this is using a variant of peak poke tester that used implicit to pass and test state. Um, but there was still this problem with that, oh, you had to have this trait that was mixed into your final test bench that actually had all these functions. Um, and then there was a bunch of issues with like, um, I can only poke in the standard data types, I can't poke in bundles. Because if you notice uh, in the tester 2GC spec, I can actually poke in a bundle literal. So I can just say, oh, A and B, that's one thing. And I have a one line, and it just feeds directly into NQ, and it's all really nice. Um, so this was kind of the inspiration for testers 2. Um, overall, testers 2 works pretty well. Um, if you saw the active balancing poster uh, last night, um, that was tested with an earlier version of testers 2, where I would actually be able to define uh, very nice uh, test abstractions, like here's a valid driver, and then here's a CRC driver for a CRC unit. And then over here, all my tests are just, oh, um, tests uh, instantiate the dot, uh, create a CRC driver, and just scan test vectors through. Um, and then there's other things like, oh, if I had a, uh, I have an active balance, I have the active balancing test. And the parallel isn't really nice if, is if I had something where things actually ran parallel, right? Like here's two PWM units. Um, so what I would do is uh, uh, I would take, I would expect this period, and then I would fork off another one. And these threads, the two PWM threads, would run in parallel to check that both PWM outputs were doing the right thing, and this would wait for all of them. And at the same time, I could also like. Uh, run another transaction through SPI. So this is where you use uh, fork join to actually test independent parallel pieces of hardware. It is just going to hang. Um, we are looking into like what's the best way to do that. Um, I think our current idea is if you don't poke something for like a thousand cycles or something, it's probably dead and you should probably terminate the test with some kind of user specifiable override. Um, but right now there is not. Um, if it hangs, you kill your SVT and you restart it and you like stare at your test until you figure out what's wrong. Which to be honest, is not a great way to program. Um, so there's no way to break in when it's... Uh, it is unclear how to kill SVT while it's doing sync. It would be easy to put a count. Yeah, but it should really be an infrastructure concern. Like, like the uh, GC, I know the uh, IO testers GCD has accounts in there, but that's all plumbing that, frankly, the test writer shouldn't care about. It can't just control C. Uh, that's a Scala test question. <laughs> um, you can ask Scala test why it doesn't catch control C. I'm sorry, what catch control C? Like, you went through something like control C or something. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think it does. Like, I mean, we can try if you want. Let's no. try. No? No, go for it. I, I'm going to okay. say that what I do is I, I run these same tests through IntelliJ. And so there I can I can run in the debugger and pause and breakpoint and look and figure out, try to figure out what's going on. So that there are alternatives. And the first shot, you can if you pause it, you usually can't. Do a full navigation, but you can at least see what you know what code you're in. It gives you an idea of what's going on. You have you have put a breakpoint in. Okay, so I basically just made sure that I was always uh, invalid, and as you can see, the test is just kind of running and running and running. Can you uh, the loop again? Huh? Can you go to the test oh. loop? Uh, so this is uh, the tester two GC spec. It's just stuck in DQ expect, and uh, the thing is inside DQ expect. Um, is basically um, this wait for valid. So while peak is false, um, it just keeps stepping. So it seems like they should have an optional parameter. There should yeah. be some variant that should have it. That would be useful. Yeah, like there might be a wait for a timeout, but I think 95% of the time, you know, pulling numbers out of a plush duck, um, your, a, a global timeout would probably be the right thing to do. But yeah, um, and if I hit Control C, 
Oh, I guess Windows is kind of smart now that uh, so they can terminate the job, but that basically just kills SBT. There's a, there is a, a fix for that in SBT. That you, there's a, some sort of directive you give it to tell it to not fail on control C. Oh, that'd be nice. Uh, Colin found it. It's in the. We should push that upstream. As uh, like through the project templates. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So is the Rocket Core using this methodology to verify that? Uh, Rocket Core uses neither peak poke testers nor testers too. Um, they have their own odd C setup because they have to deal a lot with like, they have the host interfaces, they have a bunch of random stuff. Um, I would like them to use testers too when it's ready, but uh, that isn't the case yet. Yeah, so remember that Testers 2 is kind of new, and Peak Poke Testers is very geared towards small scale unit testing. Um, Testers 2 is more like small scale unit testing that hopefully you can scale upwards to. But there's no reason why, if you built your own core or something, you can't use these for that, unless, and even if there is external Verilog, you can use the Verilog later backend. And there are actual ways of doing it on the Scala backend, too, if you want to write. Scala equivalent to the Verilog. Also take pull requests if anyone wants to uh, <laughs> improve support. When do you expect testers to like, get into production? When do you think Half-Life 3 will be released? <laughs> um, okay, so to be fair, um, testers 2 has been in development for like a year on and off, mostly off. Um, you know, I would like to say maybe in a few months where it'll be merged with mainline uh, Chisel. Um, right now, it's mostly that you can play with this dependency. You just have to register that additional uh, one line of dependency in your SBT file. Um, and if you do want to play with it, please tell me how it goes, because we would like it to be as good as it can be before we merge with mainline. The, the, the thing I'm implicitly saying in that with this not being mainline is I can change the APIs and break your code um, if I feel something bad versus once it goes mainline, we're a lot more reluctant to just randomly break people's code. So play with it. Tell me your tell me the things you would like to see improved while we have the agility to improve them. Right, but I think you could pretty safely use build tests with it because it, it doesn't affect the chisel, the generated chisel in any way. So the only cost is that if if there's some we discover some flaw in the design and we have to change the API to make it work, then your tests are invalidated, mm -hmm. but not your circuits. Yeah, there's a few planned features for testers too, like uh, implicit clocks. Um, so if you look at the uh, test adapters example here, right, the only reason I need to create this class is because I need to register a clock. Now, ideally, I'd just like to say, just step on the clocks associated with the uh, valid bits or whatever, and it would just find the clock. So I would could just get rid of that annoying, like, declaration line, I just say like c.io.in.inq blah, and it'll work. I might have to do something like c.io.in.init uh, to initialize the uh, valid to false. Um, but otherwise, um, it's just about less lines of code because my theory is that the easier we make it for you to write unit tests, the more likely you'll write unit tests, and the happier you'll be because you don't wait until integration testing when you can't find your bugs anymore. I'm a designer too. I'm like, I don't want to deal with this, so we're gonna fix it. Running well using threads does that mean you'll have tests fail potentially differently? <laughs> um, so testers two is actually fully deterministic. There is a total thread ordering imposed, um, and this is a result to be able to. This is so we can actually support things like pipelining, um, because if uh, these threads did not were just completely unconstrained in their execution. Um, it would not do the right thing, right? Because on a single time step, one time scope needs to close and the other one needs to open so that the values hand off nicely. Um, but there are, it does enforce things like uh, peak to poke reachability. So you can't like have a peak to a poke in a uh, essentially parallel thread. Um, there are some exceptions like parent threads. Um, and that's more of, that's not a your test is going to be flaky kind of thing. That's more of a you probably didn't have very good style kind of thing and you wrote a confusing test. Does that suggest that for full 
parallel coverage, you might need to use different tests with different thread orderings? Uh, there is. Since it's deterministic? What do you mean? What does deterministic mean in that? Oh, there is one thread ordering. Your threads will always run in a set order. But because of the way they're protected against writing the same things, this shouldn't have any consequence. They are not. So it does have a consequence because the way shift test works is that you have the step here, right? On the next cycle, uh, simultaneously, you, you, you run shift test again, which creates a time scope that pokes in a new value. And the previous shift test needs to have this time scope end. So the order does matter. Because this is legit, right? Like, you're supposed to be, we need to support pipelining of inputs. Yeah. Um, for example, on the output side, how would I do a randomized back pressure? Like, if I was randomly be asserted back to like output ready without messing too much with the pipeline of inputs, like, how do I know that the input is going to wait? Does it, it has that wait for ready? Um, we can certainly add a wait for, uh, oh, no, test adapters has a uh, in queue that waits for ready. Okay. So you can't do that. And you can obviously write your own abstraction if this wasn't here. You can definitely add a wait for ready function. And then on the output side, if I wanted to control the out.bits.ready or? Um, yeah, so DQ does that for you. And you can obviously write your own, like, uh, no, we do have a expect peak that doesn't uh, look at ready, or that doesn't do ready. It's just like peak the output without disturbing the ready. I'm pretty sure we're like 15 minutes over time by now, but like the next group still seems to be going on. So like, if you have more questions, feel free to ask them. They're continuing because they hear us still talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll just keep on talking and no one will be done. It's like deadlock in real life. <laughs> Wait, is the next session starting already? Okay. We have birds of a feather next, right? Yeah. Ah, speaking of birds. Did you, uh. Um, all right, so. You're going to save your. Yeah, sorry. Video? A, or to everyone's break, I will save the video. Um, but yeah, um, I think the takeaway here is please unit test. We've tried to make unit testing as easy as possible. You have the peak poke testers. You have treadle, which means that the tests just start up really fast. Um, and if you are feeling brave and want to contribute to the development, use testers too and tell me how it works. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.